Good evening. Good evening. As uh, director of the Center for Advanced Study, I welcome you all to this signature event of our center. This is an annual lecture, one per academic year, open to public, and delivered by one of the permanent center professors. And this one is actually very special because it's the 25th such event, a quarter of a century. The Center for Advanced Study, or CAS as we call it, or CAS, has a long distinguished history. Going back to 1959, when it was established by the University's Board of Trustees to promote scholarly excellence and foster discourse across disciplines. This was a historic decision that was taken by the Board of Trustees at the time, which was driven by incredible vision and foresight by many on campus, administrators as well as faculty, as there was nothing like it in any of the peer institutions at that time, nor there is one today. Four of those faculty who played an important role in its establishment, who became the founding members of CAS, were John Bardeen, who, as you know, two-time Nobel laureate in physics, Joe Duke from the math department, Reynold Cuson from chemistry, and Julian Stewart, anthropology, all giants in their respective fields. And, and this quadruple, this quartet actually displayed on day one the disciplinary diversity that CAS was committed to. Staying lo loyal to its uh, charter mission, promoting scholarly excellence, and fostering discourse across disciplines is what the center has been doing since then by providing recognition to scholars of the highest distinction and also incentives for the highest level of scholarly achievement. <coughs> With the kind of diversity it brings to campus, cutting across all disciplinary lines, and with the unifying role it plays on our campus, CAS is still unique among similar centers in all peer institutions. Now, in this program booklet, you will find more information on CAS, listing of center professors since its inception, and, and there were 82 of them, and 25 of which are current members. You'll find the listing of the previous <laughs> annual CAS lectures, as I indicated, this is the 25th one, and listing of associates and fellows, and, and this is a program we are very proud of, and, and currently, in the current academic year, there are 20 such faculty who are engaged in exciting disciplinary or interdisciplinary scholarly work. Well, coming back to this evening's special event, our speaker, Center Professor Steve Long, will be introduced by Herman Bolero, who is the head of the Department of Crop Sciences and the professor of biometry in crop sciences in the College of ACES. He's an alumnus of Illinois, so he has a long affiliation and association with Illinois. He received his MS and PhD from the Department of Agronomy in the early 90s, and he's internationally recognized for his scholarship in biometry. So now I invite Herman Bolero to the podium to introduce our distinguished speaker. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for being here. Really, this is an honor for me, a treat for me to introduce Steve uh, uh, for this lecture. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about Steve. I have a few things to tell you about him. So I'll start with... Uh, that he obtained his B.S. in Agriculture Botany in the University of Reading, which is a leading agriculture school in Britain. He graduated there with a first-class honors and with a university prize. 
After working as a biochemistry research assistant with Tate and Lyle uh, company, uh, he gained a university scholarship which led to his PhD in environmental physiology at the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom as well. At age 24, he claims he's 35 now, he just told me that. <laughs> he was then appointed as the first plant biologist on the faculty of the then new University of Essex in the United Kingdom. Um, uh, they, that opened their, their doors for uh, Plan Bio in 1974. There he progressed through the ranks to become a full professor in 1990. Today the University of Essex is one of the world's leading centers of photosynthesis research, although not quite good as Illinois, as we will hear in a little bit. Steve also spent periods working at the University of Vienna in Austria, Arizona State University, and Brookhaven National Lab in New York. Then he joined the University of Illinois as the Robert Emerson Professor of Crop Science and Plant Biology at the beginning of the 1999. His home departments are the um, Department of Crop Sciences in ACES and Plant Biology in LAS. But he's also a faculty member of the Institute of Genomic Biology and the College of Engineering's graduate program in bioengineering. In addition, he has been a faculty fellow at the National Center for Supercomputer Applications. And in 2007, he was appointed to one of our most prestigious university-wide professorships, the Edward and Jane Gutzel Endowed Professorship. And he's, of course, a professor of the Center for Advanced Studies. Steve's research achievements include a number of firsts and current records. In 1991, leading a United Nations Environment Program and working with colleagues from Brazil and the Max Planck Institute in Germany, Steve discovered what remains the most productive land plant ever discovered. Right in the center of the Amazon, the plant is called Echinocloa polystachia. Parallel work he was conducting in Europe also discovered the most productive temperate plant so far known, giant miscanthus, of which we will hear more tonight. Together with crop sciences grad student Emily Heaton, Steve went on to show for the first time the remarkable potential of this plant in the USA. Although their first trials in the US were only conducted in 2001, he has gone to inspire many at Illinois and beyond to study this remarkable plant. Today, there are over 40,000 acres of this crop across the U.S. and Canada, and it has spawned many new companies focused on renewable energy across the country. This seminal work has made Illinois the center uh, for the study of this exciting new bioenergy crop and other uh, bioenergy uh, crops as well. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, CIFAR. Um, uh, the sponsor of CIFAR uh, supported the uh, establishment of a revolutionary facility on campus, which was uh, soy phase. Motivated by his interest in how the major crops of the world will be affected by global change, this facility on our south farm is the largest open air facility in the world, investigating how rising carbon dioxide, ozone, temperature and drought will affect our major crops and how we might adapt them to this future. So a group of plants use what is known as C4 photosynthesis. They include our most productive crops like corns, sorghum, sugarcane, and plants in the wild, including quinocloa, as I mentioned before, in the Amazon. However, none do well in cool conditions. Teeth has spent almost 40 years studying why and how it may this may be overcome. Together with crop sciences colleague Dr. Steve Moons, they may now have found a way to overcome this. And he will be talking to us a little bit about that as well. Finally, Steve has had a long-term interest in combining crop and computer sciences. His lab was the first to be able to describe the complete photosynthetic process in silico, essentially describing the process that leads to all of our food and fuels directly or indirectly by mathematical equations and then simulating those computationally. Today with another uh, professor in the Department of Plant Biology, Dr. Amy Colon Marshall, 
Steve leads a project to, to now move this to mathematical and computational describe <coughs> the growth and productive of whole plants and crops, from gene function to crop productivity. I will describe Steve as uh, the person that transformed our campus. Um, and in 2006, together with uh, Chris Somerville at UC Berkeley, they led a bit in the international competition to create an energy biosciences institute. Despite competition, uh, the top universities around the world, they won. We won, Steve, right? Good. <laughs> it brought $350 million to UC Berkeley and Illinois, including the creation of a new faculty position, several new faculty positions, and um, a new facility. This was the largest single research award to any university. Facility that he provided with support of uh, the College of ACES included 350 acre energy farm in the South Farms, which is today the largest research and teaching facility anywhere for understanding dedicated bioenergy crop systems. Nine years on this award has greatly advanced understanding, research, and development of bioenergy globally, and has funded a diversity of frontline research across our campus. It has made Illinois the global leader in bioenergy crop, the understanding of uh, bioenergy crop system development and has leveraged several fo follow-on awards from the U.S. Department of Energy and others in support of plant sciences on our campus. He also founded a very popular crop sciences class, Plants and Global Change, taken by many uh, uh, across the campus. In 2012, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation invited Steve to lead a $25 million international project aiming to engineer uh, improved photosynthesis into crop. This will be a major part of uh, uh, tonight's talk. Steve's achievements have now been unnoticed. He was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in 2013, which is the world's oldest society of scientists and engineers and has included such dignitaries as Benjamin Franklin, Isaac Newton, Einstein, and most importantly to agriculture, and my personal favorite is Ari Fisher, that picture is there, uh, who founded modern day parametric statistics and which underlies much agricultural testing. Since his selection, he has risen quickly in the society to become a chair of their committee on organism and biology, ecology, and evolutionary biology. Steve has also been elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Society of Plant Biologists, and uh, the Rottenstadt Research. Um, I have to point out that Rottenstadt, Rottenstadt is the oldest agricultural experimental station in the world. Not as important as the Moro plot, by the way. <laughs> He's a visiting professor of the Chinese Academy of Science and has just been appointed to the University of Oxford most prestigious visiting appointment, the Newton Abrams Professorship. For the last 10 holders were Nobel Prize winners, so these are big shoes to, uh, for Steve to fill. 2012, he received the British Ecological Society's Marsh Award for Climate Change Research, and in 2013, the American Society of Plant Biologists Kettering Award for Research in Photosynthesis, and also in 2013, the Innovation Award of the International Society for Photosynthesis Research. Steve has um, over 400 publications in peer-reviewed journals, including Science and Nature. He's founding and chief editor for Global Change Biology, which is listed by Thomson's ISI as the most cited journal on climate change carrying full original research articles a resource that has been used heavily in UN reports on climate change. He served advisory roles on key agricultural committees worldwide, including the European Commission's Initiative on Energy, Food and Agriculture, which reports to the EU Commissioner for Agriculture, and on the Federal Biomass Technical Advisory Committee that report to the US Secretaries of Agriculture and of Energy. He has given invited briefing to the President at the White House to Bill Gates, twice, and to the Vatican. I don't know what that's about, but you know. <laughs> Steve's 
He was listed last year by Science Citation Index as one of the most highly cited authors in animal and plant biology and listed by Reuters International as one of the most influential scientific minds of 2014. I also included a lot of his uh, uh, students and people that have gone through the lab that have made all this possible as well. And they have had their own very successful careers. On the personal note, uh, his commitment to plant biology is better known to his wife, Anne, than anyone, right? And they spend their honeymoon surveying the vegetation of glacial moraines in the Norwegian Arctic. Was that fun? <laughs> All right. Uh, yet, after 43 years, they're still together. So he is a keeper. So <laughs> He's a committed uh, athlete. Uh, so committed road runners and tri triathletes will know that Steve does have interest beyond his love for understanding of plants and photosynthesis. He has run several marathons, including Chicago and Boston. He plays in several local road races and triathlons this year, including the Illinois Half Marathon and the tri -Alini. In September, he and his son run in the 200-mile Mount Hood to Coast Relay. The team came 15th out of the 260 teams in the Men's Open, making in their view the fact they could hardly walk the next day worthwhile, right? <laughs> he and his wife, Anne, also uh, chair of the Wine Lovers Group of the Illinois Club, and ask uh, Anne for details on that. <laughs> he and Anne are also committed football fans, better known as soccer in the United States. <laughs> See, I'm from Argentina, so uh, we have had some disagreements on several, se several issues through time, but uh, the most serious one has been on soccer. Um, Steve grew up uh, for, for, for football fans. I'm going to call it football here. Uh, Steve grew up near Chelsea football grounds and Anne near Blackburn Rovers. Chelsea is not doing very well this year, by the way. But they're both fans of the English national team, and I had to experience that myself uh, um, in 2002 when I told the story several times, but uh, 2002 uh, was one of those rare occasions that Eng England beat Argentina in the World Cup with a questionable penalty kick, but <laughs> that's, that's another story. And the next day, I had, I had uh, Steve Long at 7 o'clock in the morning waiting for me in my office, wrapped in an English flag. <laughs> uh, for those of you that understand soccer, I, I, I restrained myself, uh, but I waited, and I waited for many years uh, to really prove you his real passion, and I'm going to put it right here. <laughs> he was seen last year woke up cheering for the, the true team, so with that it's an honor uh, really for me to introduce Steve Long. Okay, so the topic of my talk is, I hope this is on, okay. Yeah. The topic of my talk is feeding and fueling the world from crops, and will it be possible by 2050? And I want to tell you about some of the technological developments that I think make this a possibility and finish with some of the societal barriers that may prevent us from getting there. So. I should add it's traditional at this point to really thank the agencies that have financially supported the work to be presented. And they're listed at the bottom of this first slide. Um, in particular, I have to thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, that have made much of the work I'm going to present tonight possible. Um, but the real thanks has to go to the graduate and undergraduate students postdoctoral fellows, program managers, support staff, and faculty colleagues, who are the people who have truly made all of what I'm going to present possible. Um, 
For me personally, Illinois has opened many possibilities that wouldn't have been open to me otherwise. So my real acknowledgement goes to the University of Illinois. Um, now, I think what I'm going to tell you, and this reflects, I believe, a lot of work, particularly between ACES, LAS, and these days engineering as well, is really quite a unique combination we have on this campus. Uh, this picture is showing you the, the Morrow plots here, and behind it, the Institute of Genomic Biology. This is the oldest agricultural experiment in the world outside of Rothamsted, England. So since 1876, corn has been grown here. If you like a long-term sustainability experiment, looking at effects of different fertilizer, treatment applications on, on the soil. Behind here, we have our Institute of Genomic Biology with all of the modern tools of genomic biology. And so it's really quite a unique environment that is very hard to find on any other campus of this real connection between the latest technologies, research technologies, and practical agriculture. And so this is actually Professor Morrow starting these plots in the 1870s. But I should also point out, I think very much coming out of this culture, two years ago, two of our alums, uh, Mary Del Chilton, and Rob Fraley won the World Food Prize, which is regarded as many as the Nobel Prize for Agriculture. And they won it for their pioneering work in agricultural bioengineering. And Mary Del Chilton is the uh, founder of Syngenta Corp. Rob Fraley is the executive vice president and chief technology officer of Monsanto. So my talk's going to be divided into three parts. The first one and the longest part is addressing food security and the global change, and particularly what we are doing here, what are the innovations we're looking at in photosynthesis. The second one, bioenergy without conflict with food production. And I want to finish with a brief section on barriers beyond science and technology. So the first one, addressing food security and the global change. Well, Three, three quarters almost of our calories come from just four crops globally. Um, maize or corn, rice, wheat and soy. So this is either directly direct consumption or indirect, i.e. these are used for feed for the animals and animal products that we consume. So of these, um, maize is the winner. Over a thousand million tons of that produced in 2013. Then, closely followed by rice, wheat, and soy. Although soy is quite a bit smaller, it is still very important because it's a major protein source. The United States produces a large amount of these crops. Over a third of the world's maize, about a third of the world's soy, 7% of the world's wheat. However, our importance globally is much higher than this because we are the biggest exporter of primary foodstuffs anywhere in the world, in fact. Even today, um, pretty well all of the net exporters are in the new world, Argentina, Brazil. Um, but the US is by far the largest of those exporters. So we play a very important part in all of this. Um, now, of course, we've come through 50 years where if there's been starvation in the world, it has not be, been because of food production. It's been because of inability to get that food to people who need it. <coughs> However, the UN Food and Agricultural Organization and others predict that that situation is beginning to change. That by 2050, we're going to have 34% more people. They're going to be far more urban than today. And that has important impacts. Urban populations tend to be more wasteful because the food has to be transferred and stored. They generally have a higher income, more buying power, so they consume more animal products, which requires yet more primary foodstuffs. So it's forecast 
by UN that we need 70% more primary food stuffs by 2050, 30% more by 2030, and most of this will have to come from increased production on existing land because they've just stopped making uh, good farmland for productivity. And on top of that, um, we've also got to have adaptation to climate change. So, if we look at what has happened historically, since the 1960s, with our major crops, we can see this almost linear rise in production. So, if we project forward, we could say, well, this is what we expect to have by 2050. If we can continue to improve productivity linearly, as we had have over the last 50 to 60 years. However, if we look at those projections, then this is where wheat needs to be, this is where rice needs to be by 2050. So there's a growing gap between this increase and what we need. And this is already beginning to play out. We can see it in um, world food prices. If we look at the price of wheat in um, 2006, about $130 a tonne, by um, the end of 2012, that had reached 360. So almost a tripling over that period. Uh, with peaks and troughs, which are going on to the present time. This is of some concern. For, for us, a tripling of primary foodstuffs is not very significant. But there are parts of the world where 70% of household income is spent on food. If prices double, that is catastrophic. And Halloween is coming up, so if you bump into a Louis XVI or a Marie Antoinette, um, they'll be able to tell you what happens when food prices get too high. Um, and of course, coming nearer to home, to when we reach this peak in 2008, there were food riots around much of the world. Uh, this is a picture from Indonesia, which was particularly impacted. And this may be why the Pentagon is more concerned about this than the Department of Agriculture. So one of the issues that we have to face is, can we actually maintain that linear increase? Well, if we delve a little deeper into the data, what we find is that the if we take the three largest producers of rice in the world, China, India, India and Indonesia, in the 17s and 80s, they were increasing their productivity per unit area of land by about 30% per decade. In the first decade of this century, that number has decreased to single figures. And if we look at wheat, we see the very much the same picture, that those year-on-year -year increases are beginning to stagnate. So what we might be looking at is not a linear increase, but a stagnation. Now, why, my, why might this stagnation be occurring? Well, a lot of that increase that we've seen over, particularly in rice, wheat, maize and soy to some extent, has been the result of the research of the Green Revolution and the application of that. Now, I'm going to put an equation up. This is the only one I use tonight, but I hope it's going to be clear. Why might yields be stagnating? Well, if we look at the potential yield, i.e. the yield that a, a crop can achieve under optimum conditions at a given location, that yield is equal to the sunlight energy available over the growing season of that crop. How efficient the crop is at capturing that sunlight. How efficient it is at converting that captured sunlight into biomass energy, energy within the plant. And then how efficient it is at partitioning that into the part of the crop we care about. So the grain of rice. Now if we look at figures for a soybean cultivar, modern soybean cultivar growing on our south farms, we find that that interception efficiency 
is very high. Most of that light has been captured. If we look at the partitioning efficiency, 60% of the biomass ends up in the sea. The only number that looks low is this conversion efficiency, 0.032, so about 3%. So how do these compare to theoretical? Well, interception efficiency is almost at the theoretical maximum. Um, inter partitioning efficiency, the amount that ends up in the seed, is also very close to that value. And these are numbers that were really changed quite radically in the Green Revolution. The one re that remains largely unchanged is this conversion efficiency, 3%. The theoretical is about 9%. And, of course, what this is determined by is the process of photosynthesis. We know that process in great detail, so we can, by knowing the biophysics and biochemistry of that process, we can calculate a theoretical value, and we can see that we fall far short of that theoretical value. So what I'm telling you is that if we could increase photosynthesis, we could get a substantial increase in crop productivity. But do we know that that really would occur? If we boosted the photosynthesis of a crop in the field, would we get more yield? <coughs> now, evidence that we would comes from these experiments. Haman mentioned these face experiments. And I had the good fortune to be able to set one of these up when I first came to Illinois working with um, colleagues, Don Ort and Evan DeLucia, and an engineer, Tim Meese, who's the person who really made this, this work. Basically, the way this operates is, if the wind is coming in this direction, these pipes release carbon dioxide that drifts across the ring. In the center of the ring, we measure the wind speed and direction, so the computer tells which pipes to open up and how much CO2 to release. And this system operates from planting the crop right the way through to harvest. Um, and it gets very close to our target level, which was the predicted CO2 level for 2050. So this, I should say that uh, Lisa Ainsworth, Andrew Leakey and Carbonaki have taken this experiment to the next level. They've added in many other manipulations and are looking now at how we can adapt crops to these changes. But what we found in these early years was that leaf photosynthesis was boosted by CO2. And that's not surprising because CO2 is limiting to photosynthesis. So plants in photosynthesis convert carbon dioxide into carbohydrate. Carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere is very low. So if we boost CO2, we get more photosynthesis. And by doing that, we found that we got about 16% more yield in soybean, about 12% in rice, about 15% in wheat. So we know that if we could boost photosynthesis, we would get more yield. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that rising CO2 is a good thing. It causes many other problems. Um, it was actually predicted from greenhouse and controlled environment experiments that that actually insect damage to crops would be less in elevated CO2. Unfortunately, though, the Western corn rootworm didn't read those publications <laughs> and um, did a great deal more damage, actually, in, under these conditions. And, and my colleagues, Evan DeLucy and May Berenbaum, showed that the Japanese beetle and the soybean aphid produced a lot more damage, and they went on to show why that was, that CO2 was actually causing the plant to downregulate its defense mechanisms. So whilst that boost in photosynthesis is good, there are many other things which are not. So if we go back to this equation, under elevated CO2, we'd raise conversion efficiency, and we ended up with, with more yield. Now another aspect of this argument um, is uh, what breeders are saying. This is a Long Ping Yuan, who is the father of Chinese hybrid rice. And this is a picture of one of his rice cultivars. That rice is yielding 15 tons of grain per hectare of land. 
the average rice yield around the world is about three. So what he's bred is a huge increase. But what the point he's making to me here is that he needs more photosynthate because he's saying that many of the seeds are not filling properly. He wants more photosynthesis to fill his seeds. Wheat breeders now are beginning to say the same thing as well. So why do people like Don Ort and myself and others working on photosynthesis think we can do something about this now? Well, there are three reasons. One is that photosynthesis is the process um, in plants that we know better than any other. We know every step of the process. We know every gene involved. Um, we know how to put it together. We've been able to represent that as a series of equations, one representing every step, put that together, and simulate the process in a realistic manner using high-performance computing, such as the National Center for Supercomputer Applications computer. That can, we can then use that to say, OK, where are the limitations? Where do we need to make changes? And crop transformation is becoming increasingly routine where we can test these ideas out. So one day, going into my office, um, somebody put a, a Star Trek poster on the door and I thought, oh, they're just trying to tell me I'm first generation, I'm Captain Kirk's generation. And then I thought, there's something a bit different about that poster and I went out and then I read it and I thought, I'd said too many times that photosynthesis was the final frontier for uh, potential crop yield improvement, and this was my comeuppance. <laughs> anyway, um, my colleagues here are co-PIs on the um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation project. This is Christine Rains from the University of Essex, Murray Badger from the Australian National University, Martin Parry from Rothamsted Research, and Donald from USDA ARS on campus. And basically what we're trying to do in this project is with representing the whole photosynthetic process from what happens with lighting canopies right the way down to the individual reactions, simulating that computationally, predicting where we should make changes, the most important changes we could make, making those changes, testing those in the laboratory, and then the best of those, testing them in the field. Now, um, those of you who know plants will realize that's a tobacco plant. Who is going to eat that? So the reason we're using tobacco is it's very quick to genetically engineer. Um, and we can grow it in the Midwest, so we can do field tests on our engineered tobacco to really see whether our predictions work in the field. But the idea is that, and this is beginning to happen, what works in tobacco will then go forward into cassava and into rice, which are crops that the Gates Foundation really care about. Because these are some of the foodstuffs of some of the poorest people in, in the world. And we're beginning to now move to cassava and rice transformations. What, what we're doing is rather like, it was really the modeling techniques came out of this. If you look at a car production line, then imagine you've got a thousand workers. Where do I put those workers on the line to get maximum productivity? So what you need, what do you use is systems analysis to then say, okay, where are my bottlenecks? So it might be making seats. So I need to put more of my workers onto making seats. But once I make more seats, the bottleneck moves, and I've now got to work out where that is. To do this practically takes days and weeks. Computationally, you can do it in minutes. And so what we moved on to do was to represent... This is the whole photosynthetic system. Every one of these reactions is represented by a differential equation. And we then integrate those to get the, eventually get our photosynthetic rates. Now, 
Um, most of you think plant biology isn't rocket science, but, but you're wrong. Um, what we actually found when we were trying to do this is that what we have was what, what mathematicians call a stiff system. It's, it's very difficult to numerically integrate those and get your solution. And uh, anyway, one day we were talking to somebody in computer science who was working on balancing rockets. And we were telling him what our problem was. And he said, oh, I have exactly the same problem. And I think I've got a solution. So he gave us his algorithms. We applied those to our system. And it solved the problem, which was, which was great. And so we were... So I just want to tell you, crop science is, is, can be rocket science, um, whatever you might think. And so we were able to move on then to start making predictions. So that model predicted roughly what we saw in vivo. That gave us confidence to then apply an optimization routine to it, as you would a car production line, and say, OK, we've got this amount of protein in the leaf. Where do we put it to maximize productivity? And so it picked out this protein and it said, this is a logarithmic scale, it said this one should be five times higher than it is. So then if we alter that one, it says, and then you need to adjust this one. And so my colleague um, that I've worked with at the University of Essex followed this and here is her tobacco. She put the first one in, then the second one, then a third one, and these got progressively larger. We've tested... Uh, the first of these in the field in Illinois, and it, it worked. Um, that was together with Don Ort. So another thing we're looking at is lighting in plant canopies. Leaves in a plant canopy will be going in and out of shade all the time because as the sun moves across the sky, this leaf is shading this one. And although it may seem a long time to us, for an individual chloroplast here, one second it's in full sunlight, the next second it's in deep shade. Now, what, what we see in plants is if you're in full sunlight, you're receiving more light than you can actually use. The chlorophyll, the green pigment in the leaves, absorbs that light, um, and if it can't get rid of it, it will begin to damage it. It causes an excitation state, which allows it to react with oxygen, and it eventually end up being bleached. So the plant solves this problem by inducing um, a change in its pigment bed, which allows it to dissipate most of that excess energy as heat. So this is going into photosynthesis, the rest is going into heat. Now, oh... Sorry, I just, I can get this to work. Okay, well, to save time, what I wanted to show you is that what happens that when we, um, when a leaf goes into shade, this, and now photosynthesis is limited by the light available, this dissipation as heat continues, even though the plant no longer needs to protect itself. And it takes minutes, even hours, for this change to occur, i.e. the heat dissipation stops. And so what we were interested in, we measured how long this takes, and we were interested in what does that cost the plant? And so, again, computationally, we then predicted what is happening in different layers. And you can see this first layer is following the course of the sun over the day. But the second layer is going in and out of shade as that day progresses. And this gets progressively more and more frequent as you go to lower layers. So we computed how much carbon assimilation is being lost. It varies between crops, but it can be as much as 40% or as little as 6%. But that's still very significant for the level of crop productivity. 
So what we then did was to move on to, we looked at this mechanism and we've then engineered a speed, uh, put in more of the enzymes required for this relaxation of this heat dissipation. Now at the same time they're dissipating heat, they're also emitting a small amount of light as fluoresce light. So they might absorb in the blue and they fluoresce in the red. And we can, in an apparatus like this, we can pick up that fluorescence and we can identify the plants where we've successfully sped up this relaxation. And so we then um, put that into some plants and then um, tested these. And um, this was what we were hoping to find. <laughs> that this was Halloween, a year, two years ago. Um, and here you can see our untransformed plant. Here's our transformed, I should say. This is, uh, behind this is Vanna Kromdijk, who is one of the postdocs who's led this work. And anyway, uh, last year in the field, this is one of the plots of the untransformed plants. And here's the transformed plant shown at the same stage. Not only are they bigger, but their developmental cycle <coughs> is also accelerated. So I'm just showing you two of the six pipelines that we're working on to achieve this. So I now want to turn to a shorter part of the presentation, but the other aspect of this, we believe that certainly using bioengineering, we really can overcome some of the barriers to food production. Um, now with bioenergy, of course, that's often seen as in conflict with food production. And I want to show you, particularly in the United States, that doesn't need to be the case. We could really achieve both um, and contribute in a major way to global food production. So you might also say, well, I noticed this morning that my gas is $2.09. Why on earth do we need biofuels when we can get petroleum so quickly? But it's not very long ago that it was $4 a gallon. And we don't really know what it's going to be like in, for our grandchildren, what it's going to be like in 20 years. Um, do we really want to be dependent on other people's oil in, to the future? And do we really want to take the risk that global change, like 300 of the top world climatologists say, is very much a reality? So bioenergy is something that we could do at scale in this country without impacting food production. And of course, one of the models is really what Brazil has done. Um, this is really a calculation we made um, a few years ago, showing that as you project for, Brazil has mapped out the land it could use for sugarcane production, where it wouldn't conflict with food production, it wouldn't damage ecologically sensitive areas. If it develops that, by 2030, it could be producing about 15% of global use of liquid fuels. Now, we don't have many areas in the 48 states, at least, where we can grow sugarcane. But we do have a lot of area where we can grow biomass. Plant material, um, all plant material is made up of cellulose. Cellulose is a polymer of glucose, a sugar. So if you break down that cellulose to release the glucose, and this is what goes on in a cow rumen all of the time, so we know it's something that's biologically possible. If you can break that down, then you, you've got a supply of glucose to make ethanol, um, and that can be done at scale in the United States. And this is one of three plants in Iowa which is coming on stream to make cellulosic ethanol. They're using corn stover to do that. But, of course, we've got the opportunity to use other sources of biomass and expand this technology. And in doing that, we can really reimagine agriculture. OK, if we're going to think about we don't want to conflict with food production, therefore we will want things 
which grow on rather poor land, on a maybe vulnerable land that could be subject to wind or water erosion. What type of plant do we want? So we can reimagine agriculture for that. Now this might seem as reimagining agriculture might seem a new idea. This is actually a table I was involved in producing in the European Union uh, 35 years ago. Um, the first so-called energy crisis where we were asked to look at this task. And this is a shopping list of what our plant should look like. I won't go through all these things, but one of them is C4 photosynthesis is the form of photosynthesis we know to be the most efficient. Um, we want a long growing season, something which will capture as much solar radiation as possible. With a fuel, we don't want nutrients, unlike food. So we want something which recycles its nutrients. We want something that will grow on marginal, non-arable land. So if we look at this issue of light capture, Champaign County gets some of the highest corn yields in the world. But if we look at our corn crop, this is the course of solar radiation over the year. This is how much our corn crop captures. Now, of course, we can grow wheat as well. Winter wheat, though, captures this amount. Now, we, southern Illinois, we could double crop. But there's still a big gap between these two where we're wasting radiation. So perennials, such as poplar here, do a much better job because as soon as it's warm enough for growth, they can use their reserves to, to produce their leaves over a course of a couple of weeks. So they actually do a much better job of capturing radiation. Now, we heard about, in the introduction, we heard about miscanthus. And this is really a crop that I work, I've, I've worked on now for 35 years. We were working on it in England. Um, and it proved to be quite remarkable. Um, we found a peak biomass of 30 tons of dry matter. This is in southern England, 52 degrees north. So that's well up into Canada, um, equivalent in North America. At harvest, we winter harvested it, it was 20 tonnes of biomass per hectare. That is still a record for any crop in the cool temperate zone. Now, when I moved to Illinois, I didn't expect I'd be working with this crop, but um, Emily Heaton, who was an undergraduate at the time, uh, took a course where I spoke about the work we'd done in England. She asked me after the lecture, well, who's working on that here? And I said, well, nobody. I don't think there's any interest. And she said, well, I'm interested in it. I'm going to work on it. And she did. She did her undergraduate project on it. She applied for a funding from CIFAR and did her PhD with me on it. And this is a picture of her with a crop on her father's farm near Monticello. That crop is one of the most productive we've seen, but it's averaging 30 to 40 tonnes in the first trials that Emily set up. And one of the other nice things about it is that in the spring, it moves nutrients into the shoot. In the autumn or fall, it moves those nutrients back to the roots. And then if you harvest in the winter, um, you're leaving the nutrients behind. So it's a very sustainable system. And here you can see they're harvested on the university farm. This picture was taken actually in January. So we set about trials around Illinois. Um, Emily set up the first of these, but we've had many others since. They were compared with switchgrass, which was really the favoured bioenergy crop when Emily started her work. And what you can see here is the growth of the miscanthus. Um, here in Champaign, um, reaching a peak biomass of over 40 tonnes per hectare, a harvested one of about 35. Compared to switchgrass, still pretty productive, but quite a bit lower. But the important thing is, it's also putting a lot of biomass into the ground. So it's actually producing a binding root system, which protects the soil from erosion. It's putting organic matter into the soil. And we know from our work in Europe that it could grow on very marginal land and yet be productive. This is a 72 horsepower tractor. So do we have land for the crop? Well, 
This is land use in the United States. The brown shows you where our food crops are being grown. The Midwest, the Mississippi Valley, um, Central Valley of California. But we've got this large land area here where there's relatively little food crop production. Particularly this area here, there was a lot of production before the Civil War. Most of that land has fallen out of production since then and continues to do so to this day. Well, a postdoctoral fellow working with um, Haman and myself, Fernando Miguez, um, modelled where we thought we could get productivity of this crop. And he showed, actually, this crop will give pretty high yields in many of these areas where there's fairly marginal use of the land. So, how much of land would we really need to make an impact? on global food production. Well, the government set a target of 35 billion gallons, about a third of liquid fuel use in 2009, reached that value by 2030. So how much land would we need to do that? This square shows you the amount we're using today in agriculture. So this square represents 176 million hectares of land used for our arable crops. Um, if we were to use miscanthus, convert it to ethanol, how much land by comparison would we need? We'd need about 9.7 million hectares. So really quite small. About 1% of the land area of the 48 states. We have about 11 million hectares in conservation reserve programs. And of course, it doesn't all have to be miscanthus. This is another crop we've been looking at in the Energy Biosciences Institute. Um, sisal and tequi the tequila agave, these can grow in desert areas without irrigation. They're not as productive, you'd need more land, but that is very low value, often actually degraded land. Much of what we regard as desert in the southwest is land that was badly managed when it was first settled, eroded. If you could get a crop like this on it, you could actually start to restore some of that land and protect it as well. And of course we've got also about 110 million tons of pulp, potential production, and we're using devices which no longer need that. So some of that is also becoming available, although there are some uses of that pulp that may not go away too soon. Um, so I want to finish on this topic by just talking about another project that we've been involved in and that is um, a project we call Petros which has taken another approach to this one of the things that was becoming apparent was people are getting more and more worried about where diesel and jet fuel is going to come from for the future people think they have some solutions for cars but they don't have solutions for um, heavy trucks. They don't have solutions for uh, um, planes as well. So finding a way to replace that is becoming more and more important. And so ARPRE, which was set up by the government as a stimulus package, put out a call for ideas on solving this problem. Now, of course, we all know that you can make biodiesel from soybeans. But, unfortunately, soybeans produce about one barrel of oil per acre. So you're going to need a huge land area to do anything. Sugarcane and sorghum are very productive. And so if you could make those oil accumulators, you would need far less land. So a team of us, um, from headed by our group in Illinois, but together with Brookhaven National Lab, University of Nebraska and University of Florida put in a proposal that we thought we might be able to do this and set about doing it. And one of our major goals was to engineer the stems to accumulate oil instead of sugar. And in a three-year period, we managed to get them from accumulating about 0.01% oil to 5%. If all of the sugar was to be converted to oil, that will be about 20% by mass. 
We've also made other changes. We've improved photosynthesis. We've also made it more cold tolerant. And this is what, if we could get to that 20% oil, this is the amount of oil per acre you would have compared to what soybean produces. So you can see this makes it vastly more viable. And the good thing about sweet sorghum and sugarcane is that they will grow on quite poor land, land which would not support a good soybean or corn crop. Of course, they're confined to the southeast. We've got to 5%, which already is about three times the amount of oil per acre you could get from a soybean crop. And um, we know the process is involved quite well, so we know how to crush sugarcane stems, we know how to make biodiesel. So Vijay Singh, who led the, bio, the um, techno-economic analysis, projected that our diesel would cost about, um, round about $3 per gallon, which sounds expensive by today's prices, but given that doing this at scale would probably take 20 years, that's really pretty competitive. BP independently did this analysis and came to a very similar price. So if we were to grow these crops in these yellow areas, this is really essentially abandoned land or land which is very low productivity use. That would be sufficient to replace about 69% of our current use of diesel, uh, sorry, our current use of liquid fuels in the United States. Now we've also, um, also gone on to engineer C4 photosynthesis as well. This was a harder task and this was actually a model that um, Yu Wang produced with my former student, Jing Wan Zhu. Um, something Jing Wan started in Illinois and then carried on at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, which then allowed us to pinpoint where we should make changes in our C4 crops. We've done that and here in Florida is one of our manipulations. Um, it, it appears to be more productive over two years of trials. And the most exciting thing to me is that we predicted this enzyme was a key vulnerability at low temperature. And Nikhil, who's been working on this in, in my lab, has shown that photosynthesis at chilling temperatures, i.e. about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, is hugely boosted in these plants. And so that turns a full circle. So I just want to finish briefly by mentioning barriers to achieving all of this. What we believe technologically is that we could, the United States could be self-sufficient, if you like, have perpetual oil wells, and it could continue to be the major exporter of primary foodstuffs in the world. But there are, of course, barriers beyond science and technology. And really, this, this is actually a slide that was developed by a graduate student in my lab, Lynn Massenberg, who presented, gave a presentation earlier this year on genetic engineering and fears and benefits of that. And what I wanted to really show here is that Thomas Malthus, over 200 years ago, predicted that population growth was outpacing the rate of agricultural improvement. He said by 1800 there'd be mass starvation. We've been avoiding him for 200 years, and that's because of agricultural innovation, um, such as crossbreeding, which started in the 1700s, then um, sort of informed breeding, really in this part of this century, many other agricultural innovations in agricultural equipment, knowledge on agronomy, pesticides, herbicides, um, fertilizers, um, the start of mutation breeding, and then in really the 1980s and 1990s, genetic engineering, which is actually the most precise method we have to change the genetics 
of a plant, far more precise than the technologies we were using before. Ironically, though, although this is very precise, it's kind of like meddling with a car. You know, you have a computer system which tells you exactly where you should make a change. Before that, we might have a mechanic who'd go in and, well, it might be this, it might be that. And that's what we were doing in plant breeding. We were often introducing many other genes. We have no idea what those genes were doing. They could even be toxins. It wasn't regulated and isn't regulated to this day. If we make that exact change, however, this is highly regulated by USDA, FDA, and also by EPA. So this is extremely expensive, which is why only these mega corporations can actually take any of these products to market in most cases. It isn't just GMOs where we're seeing legislation which doesn't really fit. Florida and Mississippi have enacted legislation on bioenergy crops. If you put in a bioenergy crop, um, you have to take out a large multi-million dollar bond that that crop would not become an invasive pest. If, however, you put in exactly the same plant and your reason is agriculture, then you're exempt from the legislation. Unfortunately, what's missing there is if a plant is going to become invasive, it doesn't become invasive whatever you're using it for. So it's really a failure on the part of science to communicate, particularly to legislators and to the population in general, what these technologies are. And of course, this is a real barrier to us moving forward and continuing to escape mouthless. I just put it to you. This is um, a fertilizer plant in um, Texas. So this is the Haber-Bosch process where most of our nitrogen fertilizer comes from. You could argue that the population of the world today would probably be two billion less if it was not for this one process. But I put it to you, if this was introduced today, would we really want this technology using fossil fuels, all of these emissions from a nitrogen plant? Um, organophosphate pesticides are some of the most effective we have. They actually evolved from nerve gases developed in the Second World War. And the first ones were very toxic. You couldn't apply them without a breathing apparatus. Today we've known how to sort of engineer organophosphorus in insecticides which are not toxic to us but are highly toxic to target insects. But again, these are things which I believe if that was introduced today, society would push back very strongly on it. Now, we are seeing some reversals. The UK government, which was very opposed to genetically engineered crops, has now made a reversal. It's decided, after 30 years of experience, this was a mistake. The UK should be in on, on the game. So things are changing. But we have to ask, is our opposition really correct? Are we going to do more harm than, than good? So with that, I tell you, from a scientific perspective, we could have it all in 2050, and the United States will be a particular beneficiary of that. The question is, will policy allow us? If you want to know more about this work, there are two websites, ripeillinois.edu, petros.illinois.edu. And with that, I shall finish by thanking all the people who've made this possible, I'm not going to read them out, the list is too long, but uh, I'm indebted to them all, and uh, here we go. So thank you. <laughs>
So Argonne National Lab have done quite a lot of analysis of those systems. Um, certainly, you don't get all of the energy out of the cellulose. You know, the fermentation process alone is consuming energy. But it, it's about, with present technology, the type that Poet and DuPont are using, it's about 50% of the energy in the cellulose molecule ends up in the ethanol. So, my, the, much of the thinking around these is the residue, the material that you can't actually convert to ethanol, will be combusted to provide the power to run those, those plants. And of course that's how Brazilian sugarcane has been operating for some time. So. Yes. Thank you. And some people suspect that the genetic engineering and the crops come for public health and cause genetic mutation for prosperity. So how do you think about that? And is there any regulation on genetic Right Sorry, could you repeat the uh, question? Yeah. So my question is, how do you think about the genetic engineering is comfortable with health and can cause genetic mutation for prosperities? And so how do you think about that? And is there any regulations that can regulate the genetic engineering or also? I, I'd say, well, we, we have, um, you know, no, no evidence at all that, that that change would cause any mutations. Now, you can have, I mean, plants, there are plants which produce chemicals which are in, naturally are mutagens. So, of course, if you introduced a gene that coded for one of those compounds, that will be the case, but nobody, nobody is considering anything on that level. And in fact, you know, we know exactly what every gene that is introduced. We know exactly what it is coding for. If you do conventional breeding, you know, say I have a wild rice that has resistance to a pest that I want to put in my cultivated rice. What I do is I'll cross it with that wild rice, and I'll so half of the product will be the wild rice's genes. So there's thousands of genes. I don't know what most of them do. Then I'll cross it again with my cultivated rice. And I'll do this about 10 times. And I'll end up with my disease resistance in the product. I'll end up with my cultivated rice. But I've introduced maybe 100, 200 genes. I've no idea what they do. They could actually include mutagens, it's unlikely, but they could do. Um, that's, I can do that, I can give you that plant to put in your garden. But if I take just that one gene I need, and I put it in there by genetic engineering, I can't give it to you until I've been through three sets of regulations, probably taking 15 years of testing. So... Yes. Do you have a strategy to recommend for affecting the kinds of policies you would find useful for legislators? Um, yes, I think we need many more uh, crop scientists who can really actually <laughs> who can really actually go out there, like Lynn, who's in the audience, has already given some public talks on this from a personal perspective. Try and explain you know, the technologies we're using and why, you know, why um, there is such a difference with what we've done before. I think it's, you know, unfortunate the way it went out, that it's, it's been purported to be, you know, frankenfoods and so on, when it, it clearly isn't. But um, it takes a lot of effort to then get back from that situation. So. Sorry. Similar to that, do you have any sense why the public is concerned about genetically modified food but has no problem taking genetically modified medicines such as insulin that have been produced in this way for 50 years or more? I, I, I think a surprising number of people don't realize that just about 
all the insulin you can get today is genetically modified. And in fact, you know, I think it's, it's actually a great deal safer than the insulin that was provided from animal pancreases before we had genetic modification. I think, you know, that's something that is rarely out there, that there is this allowing people to make that connection. So, and of course also, you know, the evidence we have from now 30 years in the Midwest of genetically modified crops without any incident or problem. Okay. Yes. I mean, how do you ensure great maintenance of biodiversity? Because when you push yields, high productive, you look at the seed companies, fewer and fewer, everybody wants the same things to produce the most, and the processors also want the same things that they can fit into the process. How do you address that? Because the food supply is dependent on fewer and fewer players. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, that's a great, great question, but actually, of course, if the FAO projections are correct, if we don't produce more per unit land area, then what that is going to do is now force people to move. You know, and we've seen this in the past, that if the demand for food goes up, the price, of course, goes up, the incentive to move on to more land, destroy ecologically sensitive land, goes up. The food always trumps environmental concerns, particularly in countries that have got shortages. So I see it the other way, that actually improving the productivity of our crops on existing land is the way we protect biodiversity. Because you know, once you've ploughed land, you've destroyed 90% of the biodiversity that's there. And you, you can get some of that back when you abandon the land, but you can never go back to where you were. So, so I actually see the two things as being the same, that increasing productivity is our best way of preventing, removing incentive to go on to <coughs> poorer land, which is you know, what, what has been happening in some countries around the world when they've run short of food. Okay, so before we thank Steve again mm -hmm. for this wonderful talk and lecture and enlightening and futuristic. Uh, I have something to present to him, so I have to go. This part of the podium. So this is a plaque. It says, presented in appreciation to Steve Long, CAS Professor of Plant Biology for delivering the Center for Advanced Study 25th Annual Lecture and the title of the lecture and today's date. Also, it's a framed poster.